was sleeping. He's <laughs> going back to church. So I want to again recommend the materials that you got two weeks ago, the materials you got last week. Uh, these are things that you really have to reread. Uh, especially the first week, it was more difficult. Uh, but the second or third reading, it kind of sinks in a little more. So when we discuss things here, you have the papers, you don't have to go home and read it that night, but, you know, take some time and uh, to uh, feast upon it again so it becomes more uh, evident. Okay? All right, so we'll continue. This is the last of the, 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 the uh, series. Uh, so it's the Holy Spirit in human persons and in the world. Again, it's almost verbatim from uh, the book, The Spirit of God by Father Thomas Hopko. So there were... Uh, 64 pages that covered this topic, okay? Um, and um, the, uh, well, it's all condensed on the first page there, okay? So, but we have to explain a little more on this, okay? So, all right, the Holy Spirit in human persons and the world. Uh, last time we spoke about the Holy Spirit in the church uh, and the manifestation of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Uh, the Holy Spirit's in the church because Christ is the head of the church and where the head of the church is is a body. Where there's a body, there's a spirit, a soul. And, and uh, one way to look at it is if we, we're the body of Christ, the church, the saints in heaven, the saints on earth, who we are, uh, and we're animated by the head, Jesus Christ, that there's uh, things that flow through the body, uh, an animation. And the animation that we have is the Holy Spirit. Remember, they always say that Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Why? Because the, the, the apostles were taught in everything, but they needed power from on high to go and to uh, uh, first understand and be able to explain and uh, to be empowered to bring that good news. So on Pentecost, we just had that a few weeks ago. Remember that Peter goes out and he talks to the 5,000 that day and they're talking different languages and there's a lot of conversions and things that take place. So the Holy Spirit is present in, in, in the church collectively uh, as the, the, the body of Christ. But we'll talk about the Holy Spirit in individual members, okay? Okay. Uh, and what, what that, that means. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit in human persons here, first of all, we're talking about the Holy Spirit uh, as, uh, as it refers to those that are members of the church, individual communal members of the church, okay? Uh, so the first gift that the Holy Spirit gives, and there's different gifts, well, we'll get, there's a lot of material, we'll see that later. But in, in accordance with the uh, outline that's here, the first gift that Father Thomas says that the Holy Spirit gives us is the power to know and to confess our sins. Uh, this is not a one-time action, but it's something that's continual and perpetual. It, it's ongoing. And in this sense, the Holy Spirit is a fire burning and cleansing. The burning and cleansing that first took place for us was in what? Baptism. 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 That's where uh, the cleansing from uh, sin, the precondition to sinfulness um, any vestiges of the influence of the Holy Spirit, uh, of the, the demons, were uh, um, expelled uh, by the, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the water's consecrated. The water's consecrated, so then consecrated water, we could be consecrated. And then together, <clears throat> with the baptism, immediately the gifts of the, the Holy Spirit, the chrism that is given us. So, <clears throat> this is the... the uh, the first aspect, and in this we can see the Holy Spirit as, if you want, fire. Uh, fire burns, it, it consumes. Uh, uh, it also cleanses, uh, and it also it, it makes uh, strong the, 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 the nature of, uh, I mean, the iron. Iron and fire together, you get steel, something fortified, something strong. All right, the second gift is, is what we would call deification or theosis. Uh, and this is the Holy Spirit working within us. 
so cleansing us, yes, of our sinfulness and of our passions, uh, and renewing us in the likeness of, of, of Christ, uh, and abiding within us. This is the Holy Spirit kind of abiding within us as light, all right? And what does light give? It gives warmth and it gives illumination. So if the Holy Spirit in the first instance has taken away something from us uh, by cleansing and purification, now the Holy Spirit is imparting something to us by uh, illumination and um, uh, uh, giftedness, okay? Um, And we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about the, the, the first and second gifts, okay? <clears throat> Synergy. Okay, synergia, it's a very important theological word, and it means uh, divine human cooperation. Uh, it's when the free will of a person is united with the grace of God, and that accomplishes things. Uh, goodwill, free will, in and of itself, is insufficient. Uh, the grace of the Holy Spirit is insufficient. Why would the grace of the Holy Spirit be insufficient? Because it requires a response of free will. The Holy Spirit can't force himself. Christ can't push his teachings on people. Uh, it has to be accepted. It has to be wanted. So this is what we call the synergia, the, the, the cooperation of the, the free human will and the grace of God. Uh, working together, and it achieves something, okay? Uh, when our free will is in alignment with the will of God, we are those that are authentically free and alive. If the free will acts in, in the unnatural state of autonomy, we live lives that are sinful and evil, and therefore unfree, inauthentic, and enslaved. Uh, sometimes people say, well, <clears throat> we have free will. But again, the free will, like the reasonableness of man and <clears throat> the, the three aspects of the soul, the desiring, <clears throat> the knowing, and the willing. And the willing has to do with the will, obviously. Knowing has to do with the intellect. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the union, the, the love, is, is to heart. So it's, in other words, it's to know, to love, and to serve God. To know God is theological experience and knowledge. <clears throat> to love God is to have affection for God, the desire for God. <clears throat> and serving God is having the will, the will to do what God wants us uh, to do. So these are the three aspects of, of the soul. And this is what we could say the image and likeness, uh, which is God-given in the human being is. So in other words, it's natural for the human being to desire God. It's natural to want to know God, and it's natural to love God. Uh, if the one aspect of those three aspects of the soul are out of order, there's disorder in the person. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, somebody could know something about God, but not serve Him. They could say, well, yeah, I know this, but you know, the, the will is, is not serving God. Or... Uh, you could say, well, if they love God, they would do as well. Yeah, well, they love God. Uh, sometimes we love God, but our own will trumps God's will sometimes, you know, because of our lack of faith. So it's natural to desire, to know, and to love, and to serve God. When we act autonomously, as if God's not there, or it's, it doesn't matter what God wants, then we are working against ourselves. Actually, we're enslaving ourselves to a corrupted will, it could, which is only dead-ended for us. It can't give us life. We'll always be unhappy uh, because it's not natural for us. Because, again, it's predicated on man being in the image and likeness of God. In other words, there's a spiritual DNA in us, and that has to be kind of made manifest. Okay, uh, John, the theologian, he says in his first epistle there, uh, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truly, truly, I say to you, any, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Uh, 
Now, the Lord is a spirit. This is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Now, the Lord is a spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we are all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord being changed from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Um, All right, I just want to quote uh, uh, something here from uh, the, the text that makes, that makes it easier for us to understand. I marked all these pages, but... Okay, oh, here it is, okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> Again, the, the idea of, of, of our human will in conformity with God's will. Uh, it is not as if God captivates a man's being and life, destroying the freedom of the human spirit and overpowering human nature by the power of his divinity. That's not what it is. Because we can say, well, we lose our freedom if we submit to God. So we're dominated by God. <clears throat> but he says the opposite is true, rather. <clears throat> when a human being <clears throat> is not in union with God, when he is not in union with God, he is enslaved and manipulated by the powers of evil, and he loses his godlike dignity and freedom. Okay? So again, it's natural to be in union with God. And if we're not in union with God, then we're enslaved and manipulated by evil itself. And so we're not free. God's power, grace, is not the cessation of human power. God's activity is not the suppression of our human activity. So when we do God's will, our will is in accordance with God. But it's not dominated by God. God's grace is not a divine possession or captivity of a man's being. Only evil itself can possess and captivate. God only gives freedom and liberty. To be full of grace is not to be possessed by God, blindly directed and passively moved by divine force. God does not make a human being do what that human being does not want to do. But the evil spirits that these will force themselves upon a person. Okay, so that's, that's important for us to understand. Uh, you know, because in America, in the age we live in, is the basic thing is everybody is, they're free. It's my body, I'm free to do what I want. It's my decision, I'm free. Everybody thinks they're free, and they have a natural right to do things what they want to do. Well, that's a, people that live autonomously and they're governed by their free will. For Christians, and that's who we are, for Christians, we don't do what we want to do. We do what we ought to do. In other words, there's a discipline, there's an order there. Okay, People don't like the word ought because ought means um, uh, something structured, something in order. Your whole life's in order. I mean, there's order to your your skeletal system, to your nervous system, to to everything. There, there's order to music. There's order to... Every aspect of life has order. If we don't have order, there's chaos. Uh, and if there's chaos, there's disorder, dysfunctionalism, there's unhappiness, and there's trouble and decay. Okay, So we understand that, the idea of synergia, that uh, our free will in cooperation with God's will, it doesn't dominate us. Uh, and, you're, and our free will is always there. Uh, so if we say, you know, we want to be autonomous, uh, and, and we have these conditions in our own lives where we're autonomous in a certain way, um, 
the, you know, there's the old saying that the, the minister would say that, you know, when the person was baptized, the one thing that they never put in the, when they went in the water, because Protestants emerge too sometimes, uh, that they, they never, they always made sure that their wallet wasn't there because they, they didn't want their money baptized because then it would belong to God. So, you know, they always took the wallet out. So, in other words, there are things that people do that they say, well, God could have this amount of my life or this portion of my life or this percentage of my life, uh, but I reserve something for myself. Um, you know, I believe in all this, but I don't believe in that. I, well, this is, a, again, disorder, okay? All right, uh, prayer. Uh, what, does, uh, what, what does the Holy Spirit do with the prayer? Well, uh, again, there's pages and pages on this. The question is, do we pray to, to, the, to the Holy Spirit so that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, comes and responds to our prayer? Uh, or if we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit already within us, if we're temples of the Holy Spirit, then why are we praying for the Holy Spirit to come? Are we asking for it to come, or is he already with us? Well, he's both. He's with us, but he could be more with us, if you want. Or better to say, we could be more with him, the Holy Spirit. So, uh, it works both ways. Uh, at the beginning of liturgy, we said this last week, at the beginning of liturgy, we ask the Holy Spirit to come and abide in us. Okay. Then later we're saying, send down the Holy Spirit upon us. Well, Again, if we're living temples of the Holy Spirit and filled already with the Holy Spirit, then why are we asking this epiclesis, this coming down of the Spirit on us? Well, because there's new uh, uh, offerings as, as such. There's new manifestations uh, that uh, aspire us. Okay, So it really is, is both things here. Um, Father Thomas says this, how do we understand and explain this action? Must we pray in order to have the Holy Spirit? Or must we have the Holy Spirit in order to pray? Or is it not true that we pray to have the Spirit and our very act of prayer is proof that the Spirit of God is already in us, enabling us to call upon God, even to, even to send us His Spirit, although that Spirit is already in us? Okay, um, and then again he writes in Romans uh, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses we do not know how to pray as we ought we don't know how to pray as we ought Paul writes but the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words and the Holy Spirit searches out the heart of men and knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the Holy Ones according to the will of God so when you pray, you don't just pray by yourself. Your prayer is united to God himself, the Holy Spirit, and ascends to God, the Father, you see. So the Spirit prays with us, all right? Just as Christ prays with us. Uh, sometimes we think we pray ourselves. Uh, it's not a good idea just to think you're praying by yourself. Uh, again, read, read the scriptures that... Uh, the prayer is powerful because it's uh, united uh, with God. And then, of course, you know, even in a simpler way, when we pray, the guardian angel always joins us in our prayers. Uh, the, the guardian angel that we have when we're baptized is, is always with us. And when we pray, he doesn't take time off. That the guardian angel joins his powerful prayers with, with our prayers. All right? Okay, temptation. Uh, temptation, uh, you could go to the, um, the uh, bottom of the page there, okay? Uh, the Holy Spirit helps us in our temptations, okay? Now, th this is a little lengthy part, uh, um, presentation here that, that Father uh, Thomas wrote, and it's an interesting way to, to, to look at temptation. Okay, and what the Holy Spirit does for us. Uh, being tempted should not confu be confused or equated with sinning. Sinning, for even Christ was tempted. Uh, we can have the most terrible temptations. It's it's not a sin. What we do with it can become sinful. 
For because he himself was suffered and has been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. When the inevitable temptation comes, and it comes to everybody, temptations all the time, it enters the mind's heart, uh, mind, and body. It is, if it is allowed to work in a person's members, it will certainly produce an evil fruit in that person's life. Temptation must be overcome, and it must be rejected and conquered immediately at its first entrance. Uh, this is how the Father, St. Nathus of Sinai, for example, interprets such lines in the Psalter as the following, which shook and embarrassed many Christians. Uh, we, this Psalm 137, we read this in um, the pre-Lenten season uh, by the waters of Babylon. Uh, Blessed is he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the stones, the rocks. Well, what that meant in the, the Babylonian captivity is that the, the Jews being held captive by the Babylonians uh, they were cursing them and saying, uh, blessed is the person that takes your offspring and kills them, dashes them against the stone. All right, that's historical. The theological meaning is this, is blessed is the one who takes the little ones and dashes them against the stone. The little ones are the temptations. The stone, the rock is Christ. All right, so this is the allegorical interpretation of this here. If you destroy temptation in its initial stages, um, it's better. If you play with the temptation and you say, well, I'll just think about it a while. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to act on it. But it's pleasurable to think about it. Well, it's gaining more ground in your mind and, and in your heart and, and in your, your passion. So, when it says, blessed is he takes the little ones, in other words, destroy it immediately. Don't give a second thought to it. You give a second thought, there'll be a third thought, and if it's something that is uh, uh, ingrained in you by passion, whatever it is, uh, then the passion itself flares up, and it ignites it, you see. So we have to be very careful. Okay, if the temptation is evil, is not overcome immediately, if it is taken in and played with, if not actually accepted and cultivated, it will lead to sin. I right, see, sometimes we fool ourselves that, yeah, I'll, I'll just play, but I'm not going to, well, all right. The temptation, however, can only be overcome by grace, by the power of Christ and the Spirit. Temptation cannot possibly be overcome by willpower. If we think we could, on our own, overcome temptation by a strong willpower, we make a big mistake. A person who tries to overcome temptation by willpower always fails ultimately, and not seldom after great mental, spiritual, and bodily anguish. Why? Because we put our trust in ourselves. We think we could do it. But remember again the idea of synergia, grace and the will working together? We need God to do these things. We can't do it on our own. Okay? We can't pray on our own even. Our prayer will never be perfected unless the Holy Spirit prays in us. Evil must be conquered by the grace of God, by the power of God's Spirit working in the person. Prayer guarantees this presence of the Spirit, grace and power in the person's mind, heart, and body. All right, so if the Spirit of God is alive within us and we're spirit bearers, uh, we're more empowered then by the presence of the Holy Spirit to overcome temptation. But how does this grace work in overcoming temptation? It's important to understand it. All right, I'll repeat that. It's important to understand it. Because not a few people think that divine grace acts like magic. And they expect it to do so when they are tempted. They expect to pray, God help me, and have the Holy Spirit appear and snatch him from the clutches of the evil like the hero. So we do that. We say, well, I prayed and like, you know, where's God? He didn't help me. And, you know, I was tempted and he wasn't, well, that's not what overcoming temptation is about. <clears throat> All right, uh, so we, the people think that the Holy Spirit appears and snatches from the clutches of the evil like the hero, sending his powerful spirit to crush man's evil foes. It's, it's not like, you know, a superhero that comes and rescues you. That's not what it's about, being rescued from temptation. But the saints witness that it does not happen this way. And the ill-informed expectation of some people that it should happen this way is a cause of not 
little anguish and frustration in their lives. How then does prayerful deliverance from temptation work? The saints show that it is something like this. Temptation comes. It comes and signals and activates a person's mind, heart, and body to pray to God. Through prayer, the spirit is present, unifying the person's powers, their will, and uniting them or her wholly to God through Christ. I believe that this happens when prayer is genuine and true, even when it is not Christians who are praying. Being thus in union with God, the person literally cannot sin, not because God snatches him or her away from evil or crushes evil for him or her through some brute, some sort of brute divine force, but because the person inspired and enlightened by prayer sees the evil for what it is in the light of divine wisdom. Okay, because evil sometimes could look attractive to us. Evil doesn't appear as something dark and ugly. Sometimes it takes on the appearance of what Paul says, the angel of light, like beautiful looking. Uh, it's, it's like the fruit in paradise. It looked good to eat, but the taste was bitter, you see. So it's the same thing with uh, temptation. Uh, the temptation could look good. Uh, the temptation, oh, it's a rainy Sunday. Who wants to go out? It's cold and uh, sleep in. Uh, all all the, the kind of things. But then you have to reflect and, and give yourself to prayer and say, well, Lord, help me in this. And, you know, and then the, the Lord, he's not going to zap you. And, uh, this is, you know, oh, now I want to go to church. This doesn't happen like that. But the Holy Spirit inspires us to remember the good things and the blessings that we had in the past week. And that we should be grateful children of God and go and thank Him for the blessings we received and, and the protection we had and the blessings that we want for others that we're praying for. And that be going to church and lighting candles for somebody that's sick and thanking the Lord for things is much wiser for me than laying in bed and having two more hours of sleep. You see, it's a process that, that goes on here, okay? And the Holy Spirit inspires us in this. <coughs> Uh, the person sees the evil as powerless and foolish and the object of m sadness and mourning. The person sees as well the fundamental and God-given beauty and goodness of the one through whom the temptation of evil comes. For no evil is presented to human beings except through that which is fundamentally good. This does not mean, as some teach, that evil always appears as some species of good. That is, under the aspect and appearance of being something good. Rather, it means that evil is always and of necessity a perversion, corruption and aberration of something good. Uh, it could code itself as something good, but it, it never can be. Thus the temptation to sin, rather than being externally expelled or rejected by our free will or crushed, rather it becomes itself the cause and the stimulus of the person's goodness and virtue. So, in other words, the temptation that comes to us, it's like the trial. There's temptation to do evil, right? And there's a trial. The Lord said, allows two things. He sends trials, but he allows temptations. Okay? Lead us not into temptation. And the, our Father, what that means, uh, do not uh, lead us into the trial, into the good thing that we're not able to, uh, to comprehend as such and benefit from, all right? Uh, trials are good. Trials test us. Temptations can make us stronger. When we reject the temptation and we are abiding in, in God's grace, we become stronger by that. Uh, and he gives us the wisdom to disengage that temptation. You can say, well, I, I, you know, well, how is that possible? Well, it's possible the more that we're 24-7 in union with God, uh, it's easier to understand the place of God acting in our lives. And he's doing things for us. So it becomes more natural, you see. Uh, Thus the temptation to sin, rather than being externally expelled, rejected, or crushed, becomes itself the cause and stimulus of the person's goodness and virtue. The person is tempted. He or she prays in the spirit 
and is in union with God, filled with wisdom and truth, with light and love. All right, these are the things that we want to abide in in us anyway. So the more that we're in wisdom and truth and light and love, uh, the better prepared we are when the time of temptation comes. In these such conditions like this, the person, they disarm or diffuse the temptation of evil by actually transforming it into the cause of a deeper and greater wisdom and virtue. More compassionate, mercy, greater, and self-emptying love. So, in other words, instead of seeing some temptation as a bombardment, it's going to overcome me, I'm relying on God's mercy, uh, a temptation, it should be neutralized to begin with. Temptations come because of fallen human life, human nature. It's going to come. So don't, don't get anguished about it. How could I have had that temptation? It comes. There's nothing evil in it. It's when we play with it. Uh, so we need to resort to prayer. And if we're sincere in our prayer, and we, we have the confidence of the Holy Spirit, uh, then the Lord enlightens us to understand what's going on here. That this temptation is really not good. If I give in to this temptation, uh, the rest of the day is going to be ugly. That um, I'm defaulting on my prayer life. That I'm not responding to the good things that the Lord has blessed me with. you understand what we're talking about here? Is this also an image of Christ's humanity? Is this how Christ and his humanity dealt with? What's going on around us? I mean... In, in Christ's human nature, fully God and fully man, and, and Christ was tempted. So again, the spirit in, in his human nature, his will. Uh, right, his, he, put, he, he conformed his human will to the divine will, you see. So thus, like you talked about, like again, in, in, at night he went away to pray because his human nature required this. It required it. It required it. Uh, you have to remember that. When people don't pray, their human nature is defaulting. That they become people that are spiritually more, I don't want to say ugly, but well, deformed, ugly, <laughs> not wise. They become more foolish. They, I mean, it just happens because the human being needs to pray. And, and, and Christ had human nature, and he needed to pray as, because of his human nature. Uh, and remember, it says in the gospel that when Christ went to the wilderness after he was baptized, it says the spirit led him in the wilderness. Not the spirit of evil, the Holy Spirit. And so this is a great example for the gospel, the three temptations that, that, that Christ had there, so that we would be strengthened. But remember, what was he doing? What was he doing 40 days in the wilderness? Fasting. Fasting and praying. praying. Okay? So the spirit was upon him. The spirit was with him. So in his, he conformed his human uh, will to the divine will. And obviously the responses of the Lord, uh, they, uh, he gave, the, the, the devil gave quotes from the scripture, and the Lord gave quotes back to the, to the scriptures of the devil. and says, oh, you use scripture? I can show you scripture, you know. In other words, the, the, the wisdom was here, understand? So we have to be wise. Uh, everybody's tempted, but we shouldn't like trip all over ourselves in the temptations, okay? So temptation comes. It is what it is. Uh, don't play around with it. Don't give thought to it. Uh, but again, resort to prayer. But don't expect to be zapped by it. Uh, you have to have sincere prayer and uh, already abiding in prayer. And the more we're already abiding in prayer, the more we feel the presence of God within us and the more empowered we are. And then the temptation is taken apart. We could say, uh, uh, we can say, all right, say it's gluttony. Uh, you, you go for a big meal and, and, you know, big eating and drinking. And you say, well, I had enough, but nah, a little more. And then you'll start thinking, well, hmm, it's going to be miserable. I'm not going to sleep well tonight. Um, I'm setting a bad example for my kids here. Um, I'm a little tipsy already. If I take more, I'm going to be driving. This and that. Um, is, is, do I really need this gluttonous, this over drinking? Is, is this really going to be helpful? I'm not going to be doing my prayers tonight. So you understand things unfold and you begin to consider things that 
Yeah, it's tempting. But if you look and draw back, look back at the bigger picture, you say, it's not worth it. You lose too much. You lose too much. All right, any questions on temptations? Okay, uh, particular gifts and ministries. Uh, the particular gifts and ministries, again, we're talking about th those in the church here. That uh, we read about this all the time. We hear about this, that, uh, that there's spe uh, specific uh, gifts that, that are given to us uh, by virtue of our baptism, being members of the church, okay? Um, you know, Paul is writing about this here again in Corinthians. He says, uh, to one is given the spirit of wisdom, another knowledge, another uh, faith, another healing, another working of miracles, prophecy, distinguished between the spirits, various gifts of tongues, interpretations of the tongues. All these gifts are inspired by one and the same spirit who appropriates to each one individually as he wills. So there are gifts that are given uh, in the church for usage in the church uh, by the Holy Spirit to building up the community. Uh, uh, and Paul says not everybody could be a prophet, not everybody could be a teacher, not everybody could be an administrator. There are different gifts. Uh, the thing is for each individual person in the church to consider <coughs> what giftedness they have with the Holy Spirit so that they... Uh, build up the body of Christ the church. And th those gifts, you know, it's from the very young to the, to the very old. Um, you know, there are things that people could do, and those gifts change according to age, according to need in the church, and, and everything else. Uh, the gifts, uh, again, are manifested also what we call the ministries of the church. Okay? The ministries. Usher, caretaker, servers, readers, um, visiting sick, um, charity, the, 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 the different administrative things that need to be done, even counting money, uh, bringing food on Sunday, um, sitting and talking with somebody, conversing, that all these are, are different ministries that help build up the, the body of Christ the church. Uh, so they're gifted to us, you see. And again, I think part of the problem is that 20% do 80%. The 20% carry the 80% in the church. And it's not just our church, it's, it's the general you know, norm as such. 20 people are the workers, 80% are the laid back. 20% are actively participating, 80% are attending. Uh, and, and so a lot of people, they don't realize what uh, their gift is or they don't discern it, or they don't use it, or they don't, uh, uh, it's not engaged, so it's because they have wrong ideas about the church. They don't understand what the, the church is. Uh, you know, and if they were to read Paul's letter about di different gifts and ministries in the church, and say, well, that's the priest and deacon. That's what I have to do with that. They have everything to do with that. But they don't understand. So there's misunderstanding. Now, also, when the gifts are given in the church, by the way, it's not because a person is uh, particularly holy or blessed or anything else. Uh, the gifts are given not in, not in accordance with the person's personal integrity and holiness. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, last week when we talked about the sacraments, it's the same thing. Uh, the, the bishop or the priest or the deacon, they could do the service as well. Uh, they could say the theology well, they uh, could do what needs to be do, done and, and said, but it, it, it doesn't, it's not because they, they themselves are particularly holy, perhaps. It does, does, no, the Holy Spirit is doing things. The, the Holy Spirit works through them. Uh, you know, the, the, there was always the, the old question, if, you know, if a priest is, uh, I don't know, an adulterer or murderer or something, and he hears confession. The confession that he hears is, is, since they're confessing to a priest that's a murderer as such, is that confession good? The, does the person receive absolution? Yes or no? Yes. yes. They do. So even though the priest is evil, it doesn't matter because the Holy Spirit is doing the work. It's not the priest that forgives. It's the Holy Spirit that forgives, you see. So uh, the, 
Now, it doesn't mean that it's not important what the personal uh, piety of the clergy is. It's very important. But it's not dependent upon them. It's dependent upon the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit does these things, okay? Uh, so it's important to do that. So it's the same thing in, in the, the ministries uh, in, in the church. We could say that, well, this person uh, shouldn't count money because they're not pious. And, well, it's nothing to do with that. You know, it's obviously everybody, we want everybody to be pious, but they're, they're the different gifts that are, are, are given there. All right, any question on the gifts? There's no fair, right? I'm sorry. Hmm? I'm detour from this thing. Uh, there's no fan available to, mm. to steer with the hair. No, no, nothing. No. No, we, we have to suffer a little. I think I'm afraid. You're right. Oh. Oh, oh, go, go get some water. Yeah, I don't sit there. there. Yeah. I don't sit there. It's not so bad. It's not so bad. Okay, uh, finally on the gifts. In the view of the scriptures and the saints, therefore God can and does give gifts for salvation. But these spiritual gifts, like God's material gifts, can be received not unto forgiveness of sins, to the healing of soul and body, but unto condemnation and judgment, if these gifts are received in an unworthy manner. So we have to be careful when we do receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All right, finally, the spirit in the world. Uh, in defective faith, in wrong faith, in no faith, in opposition to faith. Okay? Uh, first of all, when we say the spirit in the world, we're talking about the world uh, as it is, not the fallen world. Uh, you know, love not the thing, the world or the things in the world. Uh, uh, the world is used in, in two, different, two different senses. It's the fallen world, uh, love not the world and the things in the world. Uh, but then it says, God so loved the world, which is good. So, in this sense, it's the neutral sense that the world is the uh, continuation in, in uh, time and history of the uh, unveiling of um, uh, God's work. So, it has to do with, with, with history and going to the end of, uh, of time as such. So, what does the Holy Spirit have to do in the world? Well, according to Father Thomas here, that the Holy Spirit doesn't work in the world as such. Uh, in other words, there's no power of the Holy Spirit that's like um, like a power of a storm or cosmic storm or something that the Holy Spirit is um, uh, doing things. That the Holy Spirit works in persons and persons. And it's persons that appropriate the Holy Spirit. So there's no cosmic Christ. Uh, again, the cosmic Christ idea is, is that Christ is spiritually present in all the elements and every atom and every aspect of creation that is visible and invisible. And this cosmic Christ at the end, Christ becomes all in all. And when Christ comes in glory, there is a unification of all materiality and spirituality and this great uh, manifestation of the Christification that's taken place in, in history. Well, it's, it sounds... Intriguing, but it, it's not there. And the same thing with the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit works uh, individuals. Now, of course, God does work in the world through his creation. And when you talk about creation, you talk about not only creation, but the maintenance of creation, which is God's providence. So the fact that the earth spins, and the fact that there's a sun and a moon, and the fact that there's order in the universe, this is an aspect of God's creative power and the maintaining of that power uh, by uh, God's grace. All right? All right, uh, defective faith. What's defective faith? Well, defective faith, in this sense, would be, uh, let, let's say it would be Christian faith. Okay? The uh, UN says that there are some 26,000 uh, Christian churches in the world. Of course, that's duplications. It's like Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Japanese Orthodox, Chinese Orthodox. So, you know, some of them you could... Condense. Okay? Uh, but then there's the First Baptist, Second Baptist, and on and on and on and on. Okay? So you have all these kind of churches here. Well, obviously, some believe in the Trinity, some don't believe in the Trinity. Uh, some call them, most of these, uh, again, the 26,000, they call themselves Christian churches. Uh, if the apostles would appear in these churches, they'd say, What is this? 
they, you know, they would have no idea what, you know, they say this has nothing to do with what we were taught teaching and what was taught. So there's defective faith, okay? But how does the Holy Spirit work in, in defective faith? Well, the Holy Spirit really doesn't work in defective faith because it's falsehood. So the Holy Spirit can't work there. But the Holy Spirit does work in people. So there are those that are sincere, that don't know anything else. Uh, if the, the Southern Baptist lady in Mississippi doesn't know anything else, never heard of orthodoxy, and there are probably those that haven't heard, or just they heard about the Greek ethnic fair or something, uh, but they have no idea of, of anything else, and they were raised in that Baptist church, and they tried to be faithful to that church and to the teachings of that church, and they don't know church history, and they don't know orthodox doctrine, uh, and they, in good faith, accept what they um, have been taught, and they try to lead a good, godly life. That's a defective faith, but the Holy Spirit can work within them uh, because they're striving for what's true. Okay, so we would say that the defective faith, uh, you know, and again, it it, it varies here. It, it doesn't mean that all defective faith is wrong. That there's not truths there. Uh, and it's not that God doesn't work uh, there, uh, but the, the work of the Holy Spirit is, is in conformity with the good desires and intentions and knowledge of a, of a person. I always think, you always think of the, the story of the, the little uh, Italian grandmother from Sicily, you know, little village, and there, I mean, all she knows is Roman Catholicism. You know, I grew up in that little village there. She th she doesn't know the world outside. This is. You know, she doesn't know internet. I mean, she's humble, you know, and this is all she knows. So how could we kind of judge her and condemn her for being a good Roman Catholic? Can't do it. You know, this is what she knows. She hasn't been presented anything else. She doesn't know church history. She doesn't know the ecumenical council. She doesn't know all this. So does the Holy Spirit work in her life? Well, absolutely, the Holy Spirit works in her life. How or what matter? That's the Holy Spirit's business. Uh, wrong faith. Well, wrong faith would be faith other than what we call the Christian faith. <clears throat> Mohammedism, is, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism. The, the, these are, it's wrong faith. Uh, does the Holy Spirit work in those faiths? Not per se in the faith. In the individuals in the faith? Yes. If the Buddhist monk uh, <clears throat> tries to live according to the teachings he has and doesn't know any better, and this is who he is and this is how he was brought up, uh, then this is what it is. If a person never heard the law and the prophets or Christ or the Holy Spirit in the church, but lives according, according of nature, that is, according to the word and the spirit of God as given in creation, that means the natural law, what's written in the heart of men that Paul talks about in Romans, okay? Uh, he or she will be saved by the will and action of God. Although such a person may not consciously be aware of it, he or she is in communion with God through the word and the spirit to the extent that he or she lives in goodness, in truth, in love. On this, St. Paul is clear. And he writes this from Romans. He will render to each person according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are uh, factuous and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and then the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Then he goes on here. Uh, for, it is, for when the Gentiles, the pagans, all right, who do not have the law by nature, the Jewish law, uh, what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law, the Mosaic law. They show that what the law re requires is written in their hearts, what we call natural law. It's written in their hearts. Well, their conscience also bears witness, 
and their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Finally, the point here is this. When there are persons who have no access to God's manifestation and the dispensation of salvation in Israel and the church, or when the dispensation itself is perverted and obscured by those who claim to believe it, how many Christians today are being led astray by the teachings of their churches and, and their ministers? Uh, you have churches that allow abortion, churches that allow same-sex marriages, uh, churches that have all kinds of situational ethics or something. So somebody's a member of that church, they're being led astray. This is a, the only thing they know. Or when the dispensation itself is pervaded and obscured by those who claim to believe it and live by it, and when people do what God requires of human beings as well as they can, through their God-given, god image, and God-inspired humanity, all these people are pleasing in God's sight. And God himself will guide them as well as he can within the available conditions and possibilities of human freedom and life. This is the very meaning of divine providence. So again, we don't judge others. We don't condemn other people that have wrong faith, defective faith, no faith. We just don't do that. How that works out in their life, that's up to God and them. But what we do believe is that as much as a person seeks what is true, what is good, what is written in the human heart, what we call the natural law again, the natural is basically the Ten Commandments, if you want. Okay? That's, you know. In other words, because God is the spirit of truth, okay? And he wills that everybody be saved, don't worry. So there is hope for them. Uh, so the, finally, does it matter? You could say, well, then it really doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist monk or an Italian grandmother, Catholic grandmother, or an Orthodox Christian. Well, it does matter. Because it's not just to be saved but it's to grow to the stature of the perfection of Jesus Christ. That can be done in the church, okay, where the fullness of, of the faith is, is, is manifest here. So that's what we seek, theosis, we seek deification. Uh, for the judgment of others, that's God's business. It's not our business to, to do that. But we obviously we have to say that God does work through them. Uh, God works wherever he wants. The spirit blows wherever he wills. Okay, anything on any of the things that we've discussed so far? It's all crystal clear. <laughs> okay, let's quickly go to the, uh, the, the other pages here. Um, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, this is, you know, j just from the scripture. Uh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit are, are things that are, are manifested in a person when they're living in the Holy Spirit and Christ is alive in them. So this is fruitfulness. In other words, it's not giftedness, it's fruitfulness, that you will bear these things when you're alive in the Holy Spirit. And these are what we call the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and then there are spiritual gifts here, uh, and again, there, there's quotes here what the spiritual gifts are. You could, you could see them there um, and for the benefit of, of, of the church here. Uh, these are the gifts of the Spirit at work in the church, if you want. And then at the bottom of that, there's the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, and these are, are, again, things that the Holy Spirit uh, gives us in the process, in the process of... Uh, uh, bearing fruit, okay? So in other words, th these are instrumental uh, to the end. The end is to have the fruit, but this is the, uh, the means to it, okay? All right, let, let's look at some of the things of St. Philaret of Moscow and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit in his first gifts comes as spiritual fire given light and warmth. The Holy Spirit as light of faith works on the intellect and as warmth of love works in the heart. What does light do? Well, light dissipates gloom and ignorance. 
reveals the delusion of spiritual errors, enables a person to understand the poverty of his fallen nature, perceives the created world in relation to the needs of the soul, feels the presence of God, and imparts substance of things hoped for for the evidence of things not seen. Uh, warmth. Well, it drives from the heart and soul of man self-love. Self-love is always cold, by the way. Uh, destroys the thorns of carnal desires and purifies our, our fallen human nature. The first work of the Spirit is gift-given, is to enable us to observe the law of God and to begin establishing Christ in us. The work of the Spirit is dependent upon the goodwill of a person. Now, we talked about that. Remember the synergia? The goodwill of a person, the free action of the Spirit, working together. The action of the Holy Spirit may begin or suddenly cease. It may increase or decrease, act fast or slow, take various directions or forms. In general, the readiness of the recipient is conditional for the Holy Spirit to act. So that's an important point here. Sometimes we say, well, I don't see anything going on in my spiritual life. Well, part of the problem could be that we're not active enough in our spiritual life. So the Holy Spirit's not going to kind of force upon us uh, his presence. You understand? The condition we're in is a condition that God looks at and says, all right, I can act. Uh, but if we turn away or we put God on vacation in our life or something, uh, the empowerment of, of the Holy Spirit in our life, it becomes decreasing. Because God isn't going to force himself. You know, it, it, again, it, he's always knocking at the door. But he's not going to push the door open. You've got to open the door from the inside. And then he'll come in. He wants to come in. Uh, it's the same thing spiritually with us. So sometimes when things don't go on in, in our, our life spiritually, uh, it's because the Holy Spirit's not working actively, perhaps. But he's not working actively because we're not actively disposing ourselves, you see. So it takes two to tango, as they say. All right? And that's not necessarily predicated on personal circumstance, right? Didn't that, the other day on Facebook that I see, it was just something posted there about that, it was a Father Roman Braga, is he a R Romanian priest? Yes, he was here he once, sir, liturgy. But, right but he was like talking about the gift that he received by being placed in a prison. I mean, it was a very, very unique situation, but I mean, here he's in this horrible situation, but he said... Yeah, he, he said he was, never felt closer to God than he was in, in, in prison and, and being beaten and tortured. Yes, because... And he, he found his faith. His faith was... Because he, he, he had faith. But he turned to the Spirit there, and what he had was the Spirit. Yes. It's all he had. And, and yet he turned there. He didn't... What was me and all this kind of thing? He, he just turned to the Spirit, and the Spirit just filled him, That's despite the, the physical circumstances around him. Yeah, it, it was one of the worst prisons. Uh, they sent a murderer in to, to kill him, and... and uh, you know, it was psychological torture. I mean, it was not only physical, it was psycho... It was, it was, but it, it's a great video to see. It's on our... Is, on, is it on our... I don't know where I saw it. I don't remember. Well, we could, I'm, I'm I'll, I'll put it on our, our, our Facebook again. Uh, yeah, Father Roman Braga, the great Romanian. He should be canonized as a saint already. Uh, in any case, yeah, it, it's the, the condition, you see. I mean, but even Paul says that. You know, he's, well, he does it for his day. He'll, he'll brag. He says, well, I was shipwrecked twice. I was in prison. <laughs> and this like happened. And and this, and this, that, and this and that had me. Like, he's bragging. He's like, look what happened to me. Like, you know. Uh, he, but he's taking joy in his affliction because what? It drew him closer to God. Well, because he was a person of faith to begin with. But you have to remember that when there's afflictions, troubles, sorrows, circumstances... If people aren't spirit-bearing in their life and Christ-centered, instead of being strengthened by this, they're crushed by it. And the little faith that they have, they lose. Because, you see, it's the old story. You know, if you need something, it's good to have something in the bank. So you could build and you could do what you need to do. But if you have no money in the bank... You're not going to be able to build or do something, you know. In other words, you have, you have to be prepared. You have to have something, you see. Uh, so, a, again, the, the thing here is, is that, uh, again, St. John Chrysostom, we do 
God does 99% in our spiritual life. So all he's asking is for us to take the baby step, the 1% the step, and he'll meet us. And he'll carry us further than we ever thought we could go. Uh, but if you know, we don't engage him, then our, our life becomes spiritually stale. Okay, what indicates the Holy Spirit is working in a person? Uh, again, remember the first thing Father Apko said? Uh, knowledge of one's sins. One sees clearly his sins, infirmities, spiritual infirmities here, faithfulness before God. He is aware of his spiritual poverty. Uh, that doesn't bring depression. It doesn't bring spiritual anguish. It's just an acknowledgement that I'm a sinner. It's a good thing to acknowledge you're a sinner, okay? Uh, the past wrongs and deeds become seeds for future judgment. Learn from the past. This is what happened to me. I'm not going to do this again. Uh, I'm going to make the bad deed uh, seeds for something better. Heartfelt repentance. The really desire to change your way. And a newfound trust in God. Uh, sometimes we trust in God, but we always need to increase that, that trust in God. Uh, again, we never have enough faith. You know, sometimes a priest will ask in confession, say, um, do you, do you believe you have faith? Oh, Father, I have strong faith. Oh, yeah. But they say, like, oh, Father, why do you even ask? Of course I have strong faith. Well, all right, well, let's see what happens, you know. I mean, because in times of affliction, sorrow, distress, circumstances, sometimes that faith isn't there. You know, people, they, they kind of collapse. And, and to trust in the Lord, it, it's a good thing. Uh, but even if you're a friend of Jesus, like Peter, Peter was a friend of Jesus, and uh, he said, if you're the Lord, let me walk on the water to you. I mean, that's bold. That's bold of Peter. I mean, who, who of us would have said that? Let me walk on the water to you. I mean, that's really bold, okay? You have a lot of nerve and trust. Probably foolish. The other possible would probably say, this guy's like... All right, and then he does it, okay? So he trusts the Lord, but he didn't trust him enough. Why? Because what happens? He looked down. He took his eye. He took his eyes off the Lord. Just for a second. And it says he, he noticed the wind and the, the, the waves. And that captivated him. And he lost his, his eye contact with the Lord. And then... So it's the same thing with us. When we lose eye contact with the Lord, we begin to sink spiritually. Uh, the Holy Spirit acts. The, the Holy Spirit uh, establishes the fear of God in us. It roots out evil sown before and demolishes passions built over long time. So we can say, well, I'm so passionate. I still have this passion. Well, yeah, but maybe they're, maybe they're becoming less intense, okay? Uh, it takes one along the narrow way of self-renunciation. Character changes take place by degrees. We're not zapped saints and become overnight. It doesn't happen that way. It's a slow transformation. Although there are instances where there were sudden transformations of, uh, you know, or, you know, people changed. Uh, but remember even Mary of Egypt, when she had her uh, experience, a conversion experience, and, and she went into the wilderness for the, 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 uh, the years there. I mean, she says the, the first uh, 17 years, they were horrible for her because all the passions were ready. She confessed that she hated them, but they were already within her, and it, it took half her lifetime in the desert to, to uh, have them uprooted by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit not only uprooted her passions, but inspired her to know the whole New Testament. She had no book to read, but she knew the New Testament. Uh, the action of the Holy Spirit, it does this, and it's always doing this for us, in different ways, at different times. The Holy Spirit is cleansing us, He's enlightening us, He's regenerating us, He's sanctifying us, and he's saving us. All those are actions of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and gifts are given to a person for the benefit of others. Again, especially in terms of the church body, we have to think, uh, what am I gifted with? What things could the Lord call me, what ministry to build up the church? Uh, gifts are not, manifestation, are not always manifested as there is insufficient faith or captivation by the spirit of this age. So, uh, again, the, the, 
the Holy Spirit could be gifted, we could be gifted with things, but if we're not attentive to it and we're captivated by the glamour of the world, the fallen world and things, it's, it's dormant in us. Uh, all right. Um, all right, teaching of St. Simeon, the new theologian, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to us as an initial light. The Father is light, the Son is light, the Holy Spirit is light, the whole eternity, glory to thee. The Holy Spirit may come and abide in a person free from passions and purified. We are entirely powerless to measure the Holy Spirit with our mind or express his actions in our words. The work of the Christian is to conceive the Holy Spirit. And this is what uh, he, he writes, St. Simeon. Conceive the Holy Spirit. It, it reminds you of St. Seraphim of Sarov to acquire the Holy Spirit, right? We may summarize the activity of the Holy Spirit by the following words of Saint, uh, Simeon, in which he speaks of men who have already received the fullness of grace. Like St. Seraphim of Sarov, for example, St. Gregory Palamas. It is its total and ineffable character which Simeon emphasizes especially. These saints, he says, they no longer belong to themselves, but to the Spirit who is in them. The Spirit moves them and in turn moves by them. And then he becomes all the things you hear enumerated in the divine scripture concerning the kingdom of heaven. All right. The pearl the mustard seed, the leaven, the water, the fire, the drink of life, the living spring of water, the well that wells forth, streams of spiritual words, utterances of divine life, lamp, wedding bed, nuptial chamber, bridegroom, friend, brother, father. All these things, and the Spirit abides within us. But why multiply these words? Why endeavor to cover all these titles? They are beyond numbering. Indeed, how can language fathom or express in words the things that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, things beyond the mind of men? How can it be expressed in words? Even if we received all this within us as a gift of God, we are entirely powerless to measure it with our mind or express it in words. Uh, so, again, the person of the Holy Spirit within us, nebulous. We, we can't get a real image of him. But we do know him through the experiences of his working within us. You know, with Christ, we have an image of Christ because he had humanity. We say, this is the Christ. You can't say, this is the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a still small voice. The Holy Spirit is the fire. The Holy Spirit is the rustling wind. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the living water. Uh, it, 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 it's images of, of manifestations of action, of things going on that again, regenerates, cleanses, illumines, purifies. To particular persons in time and space, right? particular times. But it's personal, personal again. It's personal, personal. It's always personal. It's personal. It's, it's not in general. It's not like, it's not the Holy Spirit is regenerating the world, illuminating the world. No, no, no. It's only in persons. It's in persons. Okay? It's always personal. And as Falakwa says, there's nothing individual, but there's everything personal. Um, all right, and, and then you can read this other section here. Um, uh, I, I don't know if we really want to read this here. It's, uh, it, he talks about the fire of the Holy Spirit is like a burning oven, and uh, what happens in an oven. Um, so that gives you something to look forward to. So you could read that uh, yourselves later. Okay, let's go to the last page. Right? St. Seraphim of Sarov uh, in the parable of the ten virgins and the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, and this, this is uh, the, the, the story, you, you probably know the story, the apparition. Of, uh, it, it's in the life of St. Seraphim of Sarov who died 1837. Um, his famous talk with Nikolai Motovilov in, in the uh, forest in the middle of the winter, in the snow, and he's having this wonderful... It's called... matter of fact, it's called that. It's called A Wonderful Conversation. That's what it's called, The Wonderful Conversation. And this is a part of it. And, and Nikolai Mot uh, Motovilov wrote, wrote this down from memory here. And uh, 
it's, it's a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And in, in this part, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, St. Seraphim, okay? And this is what St. Seraphim is sort of says. Uh, of course, you know the parable of the ten virgins, right? Who could relate the... the What was, the, what was the story, the ten virgins? How many? Five and five. Five had what? And oil in the lamp. And five didn't. And five had oil in the lamp, and five had not on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the bridegroom comes at midnight, and they're all sleeping. The message goes out, the bridegroom's here. Of course, the bridegroom's Christ. Uh, and they trim their lamps, those with the oil. Um, those who don't have oil said, hey, give us some of your oil so we could trim our lamps. And they said, no, no, if we give you oil, then that be enough for us. Go to those that sell the oil and get some for yourselves. And so they go out. They go out. And meanwhile, the bridegroom comes, and uh, the doors are closed, and the foolish virgins come later and they went in and said, no, too late, you're not, not coming in, you're out, you lost it. Uh, so that's read during Holy Week. Uh, so this is what uh, St. Seraphim says. In the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, when the foolish ones lacked oil, it was said, go and buy in the marketplace. But when they had bought the oil, the door of the bridal chamber was already shut and they could not get in. Some say that the lack of oil in the lamps of the foolish virgins means a lack of good deeds in their lifetime. Such an interpretation is not quite correct. Why should they be lacking in good deeds if they are called virgins, even though foolish ones? Virginity is the supreme virtue in an angelic state, and it could take the place of all other good works. I think that what they were lacking the foolish virgins, was the grace of the all-Holy Spirit of God. These virgins practiced the virtues, but in their spiritual ignorance, they supposed that the Christian life consisted merely of doing good things, good works. By doing a good deed, they thought they were doing the work of God. But they little cared whether they acquired thereby the grace of God's Spirit. Such a way of life based merely on doing good without carefully testing whether they bring the grace of the Spirit of God are mentioned in the patristic books. There is another way which is deemed at the beginning, but it ends in the bottom of hell. So the foolish virgins, they were good girls. They, you know, they did good things. Okay? Uh, but they thought by doing the good things, by being <coughs> virtuous, uh, by living by the virtues, uh, that it was sufficient, that it was what God wanted. In other words, obey the law, keep your nose clean, do these things, and everything will be okay. Uh, but St. Seraphim says, well, they're really foolish because what they should have acquired was the gift of the Spirit, and they didn't even seek that out. And St. Anthony the Great, in his letters to the monks, say of such virgins, Many monks and nuns have no idea of the different kinds of will which act in man. They do not know that they are influenced by three wills. The first is God's all-perfect and all-saving will. The second is our own human will, which, if not destructive, yet neither is it saving. And the third will is the devil's will, wholly destructive. <coughs> This third will of the enemy teaches man either not to do any good deeds or to do them out of our own will and teaches us to do everything to flatter our passions or else to teach us to do good for the sake of good and not care for the grace which is acquired by it. All right, so it's people doing good because it's a good thing to do, okay? And they think that this is what God wants and it's acceptable to God. But the first God's all-saving will consists in doing good solely to acquire the Holy Spirit as an external, inexhaustible treasure which cannot be rightly valued. 
The acquisition of the Holy Spirit is, so to say, the oil of which the foolish virgins lacked. So this is, they had the, the lamp, but they didn't have the oil, the presence of the Holy Spirit, okay? They were called foolish just because they had forgotten the necessary fruit of virtue, the grace of the Holy Spirit, without which no one is or can be saved. For, and we read, this is sung at the feast days, those that go to Matins know this, every soul is enlivened by the Holy Spirit and exalted in purity and a sacred mystery illumined by the Holy Trinity. This is the oil in the lamps of the wise virgins, which could burn long and brightly. And these virgins with their burning lamps were able to meet the bridegroom who came at midnight and could enter the bridal chamber of joy with him. But the foolish ones, though they went to the market to buy some oil, when they saw their lamps going out, they were unable to return in time for the door was already shut. The marketplace is our life. The door of the bridegroom, which was shut and which barred the way to the bridegroom, is human death. And the wise and the foolish virgins are Christian souls. The oil that is needed is not good deeds, but the grace of the Holy Spirit, which means the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, which is obtained through them and which changes souls from one state to another, from corruption to incorruption, from spiritual death to spiritual life, from darkness to life, from the stable of our being where the passions are tied up like dumb animals and wild beasts into a temple of divinity, and to the shining bridal chamber of the eternal joy of Christ Jesus our Lord, the creator and redeemer and eternal bridegroom of our souls. So, again, the favorite expression of St. Seraphim Sarov, everybody knows this, I'm sure. What does he say? Who said that? He's giving him a star. Very good. Acquire the Holy Spirit and a thousand around you will be saved. Okay? Uh, and he also says, St. Seraphim Sarov, that the fruits of the Holy Spirit are only given to those who do things in the name of Christ. Again, you could give somebody a glass of water. It's a good thing. Somebody's thirsty. Somebody needs something. It's a good deed. Good deeds are good things. Uh, but for Christians, it's not enough. A Christian doesn't give a glass of water to somebody. A Christian gives a glass of water in Christ's name to somebody. It's a big difference. Okay? Because it's an expression of love for that person. It's just not a human need order, you see. Uh, so good deeds, don't get me wrong, and don't get the, the St. Seraphim wrong on this. Good deeds are good, but it's insufficient. It's not enough. Uh, and, you know, sometimes as Christians, we, we hear that, that, you know, people say, and, you know, somebody asked me once, Father, how can I fast so I don't sin? Well, they're, they're put in, the, in a negative column already, like, like it's negative. Why is it negative? Fasting empowers you. It's nothing, you know. Or somebody else says, uh, like, uh, true story, so I'm not making this up. You know, the lady says, um, uh, I'm 80 years old now, so why do I have to go to confession? I don't sin. I said, well, that's why you have to go to confession, because you just sin, saying you don't have to go to confession, because you don't sin, and you do sin, because in your ignorance you made a, a sin there, you see. She, she still didn't understand that, though. She thought she should be, a senior citizen should be excused from confession. There's no need for it. Uh, it's sad. I, I mean, you know, who knows how the person was brought up, but um, you see. So, uh, all right, anything else about the Holy Spirit? Anything that we covered today or in the past uh, two weeks that you want to say anything about? Okay, generally, we don't think too much of the Holy Spirit, although if you look at your prayers... Uh, in the Divine Liturgy, we're always talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, every doxology, glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, even the prayer, Holy God, that's the Father. Holy Mighty is Son. Holy Immortal is Holy Spirit. Uh, 
Uh, sometimes we don't even think that, that that's that, but that, that's uh, what that is there. So the fact that we don't, can't maybe get the, the personal link with the Holy Spirit, it shouldn't bother us. It shouldn't bother us, you know, because, uh, you know, there are those like St. Seraphim of Sarah, St. Simeon the Theologian, and, and others that had uh, this ab abiding uh, feeling of the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. Th these were great perfected saints. Uh, you know, not everybody has that uh, experience of that. And the Holy Spirit usually works in a quiet way, not in a, a big, noisy, fanfare way in our lives. You know, by, spirit, by little increments in our life, uh, we become less passionate, uh, uh, more faithful, uh, more abiding in hope, uh, more trusting, more illumined by the grace of the Holy Spirit to know the will of Christ. The Holy Spirit points us to Jesus Christ, okay? And Jesus Christ points us to God the Father. Uh, so it's easier for us to know Jesus Christ. But remember, everywhere Jesus Christ is and everything that Jesus Christ does, uh, that work is brought to fruition and completion by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, so we need to be aware of uh, the, the Holy Spirit. Okay? And just think of it this way, that any, any, anytime anything's like even blessed in a church... Everything is, is blessed. Water is blessed by the Holy Spirit. Fruit's blessed by the... I mean, every, everything that's blessed, let alone consecrated. Uh, so consecration's blessings uh, in, in terms of the things that are material things that we have is by, is by the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but again, finally, the Holy Spirit, uh, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul says? It doesn't just mean the body. It means the body and the soul. And we talk about the body here, it means the will. It means the affections. It means every aspect of us. Uh, so when Paul says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? It means your being, your person. Uh, okay? We're done. Anything else? Yes. So uh, earlier you mentioned there's uh, like sort of three aspects of the soul, um, and just uh, could you repeat those again? I, I got knowledge. All right. The, the three aspects right. of the soul. The soul is one. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah. the soul is one, but the three aspects of the soul. Uh, and, and the Lord says, uh, the first commandment is, is to love the Lord thy God with all thy um, soul, uh, with all thy uh, heart soul, and mind, okay? The mind is what we call the nous, N-O-U-S, the, the it's, it's not only the reasonable, but it's the intuitive part of the soul that we know God, we experience God. This is called the nous. There's a whole, we've covered that in past courses, if you remember the nous. Okay, so this is how we know God. But the knowledge of God is always by experience. It involves the intellect. But it's much more than the intellect. It, it's knowing uh, what they call. Uh, where's uh, Catherine here? She's not here. No. Uh, it, it's uh, I forget the Greek word for it. It means real knowledge, not just knowledge about, but knowledge of. Mm -hmm. Knowledge about is okay. So to know the love is the uh, affective part of the soul. This is where we identify with the heart as such. Uh, the love uh, to love God. Uh, the, the, the desiring part, okay, uh, to be captivated by the love of God. And the third part is the, uh, the will. Um, uh, this is the, the aspect that uh, we have a movement uh, of our, our direction to have our will in alignment with uh, the will of, of God. Uh, now, we can love God and we can know God, but doing the will is a serving of God. But it's possible for us out of laziness or indifference not to do the will of God and not to have our, our will in conformity. We could have a weak will. Sometimes people say that. I have a weak will. I'm going to eat this. The will's not strong enough, you see. Uh, 
or somebody, uh, you know, in Arius, the heretics would like that. You know, they can have a knowledge about God. Uh, but, you know, uh, but then, then the love is not there. You see, so in other words, all th these three aspects of the, 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 the soul have to work together. The, the knowing, the loving, and the doing. The, the will is the doing. The knowing is the knowledge of God, and, and the love is the affection for God. All this have to work together. And this is what is the natural disposition uh, of the human being, uh, to have all these things. When one is out of whack, there's a, a defectiveness here. So... Uh, uh, if you remember the, when we covered this a while back uh, with um, the we, we covered this uh, topic of the, the, the natural man remember the first thing that Adam and Eve the first thing where did they where was their first fault in what aspect of the soul the, no, the mind the noose why because instead of keeping their eye on the Lord, the spiritual eye on the Lord, they fastened it on the created, the tree. They were infatuated by the tree. You understand? They, they, you know, God walked with them in the cool of the evening. They should have kept their eye on the Lord. But they looked on something improperly. They, they saw the tree not as God saw it. And God said that this is a tree of... Um, uh, of um, good and evil. Don't go near it. Don't touch it. You do, it could be big problems. Okay? And this is how God saw that tree. And he instructed them. Their news, they, they weren't contemplating God's will anymore. And so they, they fell in their news. And then they fell in their will. Uh, because, you know, uh, Adam said, hey, I mean, Eve said to Adam, hey, taste this. It tastes good. So, you know, and he fell, you know, uh, she fell for the, the, the devil's, uh, through the snake, and he fell through her, her uh, enticement. Uh, so, again, it, it's kind of what's proper to our nature that we have to do that there. All right, so listen, God bless you. And uh, again, remember the first prayer always is, O heavenly, he comfort the spirit of truth. And we ask for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives every day uh, in our prayer co corners. When we gather as a church community, uh, you know, uh, and in your prayer book, there's even a, a, other prayers to the Holy Spirit that, that you, you could uh, find there. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's not enough for the Holy Spirit to be out there. The Holy Spirit has to be uh, in us and, and with us. Okay.